If you're like me and grew up in London, you probably spent many a sticky summer's day getting sunburn on the muddy beaches of Southend and Clacton. These seaside towns are a few hours drive away from London and represent the nearest bit of beach for most Londoners. They're not exactly wild and untamed stretches of golden sand, merely the spot where the River Thames widens and empties into the North Sea. If you ask a British person what they think of the North Sea, you'll probably get words like brown and boring and lifeless. I mean, there's almost definitely more interesting things living in the South End Sea Life Centre than in the sea, right? Well, that's where you're wrong, because the North Sea is criminally underrated, and here's why. The North Sea is about 500,000 square kilometres in size, so it represents about 0.5% of the world's oceans. And it has an average depth of about 90 metres, so it's remarkably shallow. It's bordered by quite a few of Europe's powerhouse countries, so the UK, Norway, Denmark, um, Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium and France and having to share these waters with so many countries can at times be quite difficult. Just take the UK and France. When the relationship works well we get miracles of diplomacy like the Eurotunnel and when the relationship breaks down we get things like the Scallop Wars. Because most people's experience with the North Sea is lots of mud and very murky brown water, I think many people don't realise the variety of absolutely stunning habitats that we have in the North Sea, some of them just a few metres from the coast. So let me introduce you to a few of them now. First off, we have beautiful kelp forests with all shapes and colours of seaweed. There are also sea pen gardens with bioluminescent sea pens like Penatula phosphorea and ethereal brittle stars reaching up with their arms to feed on particles drifting through the water. There are extensive eelgrass meadows with two species of adorable little seahorses. chalk reefs such as the Great Norfolk Chalk Reef and merl beds made of coralline algae supporting anemones and worms. But I do understand that kelp and seagrass isn't everyone's cup of tea, so let me tell you about some of the amazing animals that live in the North Sea. The North Sea is home to thousands of grey seals and common seals, which ironically are less common. And these chubby marine mammals can be observed peacefully snoozing at many sites around the North Sea. In places like the Farne Islands, you can go diving with grey seals and they sometimes like to nibble the flippers of divers. 
The Farne Islands are also home to lots and lots of seabirds, such as Arctic terns, who like to attack small children for fun. So if you are planning a visit, a hard hat is definitely a must. These terrifying birds have possibly the longest migration of any animal, travelling over 70,000 kilometres between the poles every year, living in an endless summer. You can also spot other species of seabirds like the shag. And of course, everyone's favourite, the puffins. Time for a puffling break! Elsewhere in the North Sea, you will find Bass Rock, the world's largest colony of northern gannets, my favourite seabird, with over 150,000 of them to see and smell because of all of their poop. Now, lots of seabirds living in the North Sea depend on sand eels for their food, and I cannot hype up these little fish enough. They are so, so important for larger fish and all of these seabirds, just, just incredibly underrated. But they themselves depend on plankton for food. Uh, copepods such as Calanus trinmarchicus and Calanus helgolandicus. Now, speaking of fish like cod and haddock and pollock, one of the most productive areas for fishing in the North Sea is a very shallow sandbank called Dogger Bank. Now, remember I said the North Sea has an average depth of 90 metres? Well, at Dogger Bank, it can be between 15 and 40 metres, so it's very, very shallow indeed. Now, Dogger Bank actually used to be above the water. It was a land bridge connecting the UK to Europe called Doggerland. And during the Stone Age, we know that there were communities of people living there, as well as mammoths and woolly rhinos. But about 8,000 years ago, uh, a series of underwater landslides called the Storega Slides um, happened, causing a massive tsunami which would have flooded Doggerland um, and killed many of those Stone Age inhabitants. After the Storega Slides, um, as the earth warmed up, the, uh, all the ice began to melt and sea levels rose and a bit like Atlantis, Doggerland sunk beneath the waves and became lost to time. Now Doggerbank is very heavily fished, but fishermen who go there uh, sometimes develop a nasty medical condition called Doggerbank itch and it's caused by handling nets which have a bryozoan on it. These colonial organisms can produce um, a very nasty substance which basically triggers an allergic reaction and causes the fishermen to develop a rash on their skin. Believe it or not, Doggerbank was also the epicentre of the strongest earthquake ever recorded in the UK um, in 1931, there was an earthquake with a magnitude of 6.1 on the Richter scale, which hit and apparently killed two people. So there we are. Now, at the other end of the scale, the deepest area of the North Sea is in the northeast, and it's called the Norwegian Trench. And it goes down to about 725 metres. Because it's so deep, it's home to a lot of organisms that we would usually only find in the deep sea, and they exist in this little isolated patch of habitat here in the North Sea. So we see things like gardens of bamboo coral and bubblegum coral uh, and some deep sea sponges, as well as very unique looking fish like the round-nosed grenadier.
But when you look around the North Sea, there are also random little deep bits. So off the coast of Scotland, we have the Devil's Hole, which goes down to about 450 meters. And then off the coast of Norfolk, we have the Silver Pit, which goes down to about 95 meters. Um, and at one point it was theorized that it was actually the crater of uh, a meteor impact, but we're less sure about that theory now. Okay, now it's time to talk about cetaceans, which are the whales, dolphins and porpoises, because there are quite a lot in the North Sea. So the smallest are little harbour porpoises, adorable little animals. Uh, the males have something called megatestes, which means that during the breeding season, their testicles become so big that they weigh up to about four to seven percent of their total body weight. Um, then we have minke whales, my favourite whales, uh, white-beaked dolphins. Um, you can see them quite commonly off the northeast coast. So I always saw them when I was at uni and I would go on my lunch break when I was doing field work. Um, and then, of course, everyone's favourite bottlenose, bottlenose dolphins as well. There are also a number of species which are less common, but still frequently observed. So we have short-beaked common dolphins, we have Atlantic white-sided dolphins, we have uh, long-finned pilot whales, which, parasite time, um, they can suffer from a really nasty parasite which only infects the penis. Isn't that amazing? I know. Uh, Risso's dolphins, and then of course, uh, killer whales or orcas. to other big things, we have so many cool fish and sharks in the North Sea. Let me tell you about the sharks because we have basking sharks, bird beak dogfish, black mouth cat shark, blue shark, blunt nose six gill shark, great lantern shark, Greenland shark, kite fin shark, leaf scale golfer shark, long nose velvet dogfish, nurse hound, poor beagle, Portuguese dogfish, small spotted cat shark, smooth hound, spiny dogfish, starry smooth hound, tote, thresher, and velvet belly lantern shark. We also used to have angel sharks. They've been extirpated, which means they are locally extinct now in the North Sea, but you can still find them um, to the west of the UK. So. Hopefully they're going to make a comeback. Another critically endangered uh, elasmobranch is the common skate, which again, like the common seal, ironically, is super endangered now. Um, it's the biggest skate in the world. It can reach over nine foot in length and two meters in width. They're just incredible animals and it makes me so, so sad that we have overfished them to the point of them being critically endangered. We also have uh, very exciting bony fish or teleosts in the North Sea. So we occasionally get uh, Atlantic bluefin tuna. Um, and back in the 1930s, there were so many that uh, tunny fishing off of um, the Yorkshire coast became a very popular pastime for the British elite. Um, and we've started seeing tuna again now and it could be that their presence is linked to something called the Atlantic Multi-Decadal Oscillation. Uh, it's a bit like El Nino, if you're familiar with El Nino. It's to do with um, these regular fluctuations in the sea surface temperature, which affect the productivity of the oceans and the fish stocks. We also have European eels, which are, um, they live in freshwater, but then when they go to spawn in the Sargasso Sea, they travel through the North Sea, as well as the conger eel, which is the heaviest species of eel. Um, and we used to have two species of sturgeon, the Atlantic sturgeon, and then the truly European sturgeon, 
but these guys are now only found uh, in one river in France. Um, it's quite sad because they are so big and so cool looking. So I've just spent the last few minutes telling you about how amazing the wildlife in the North Sea is and the beautiful habitats that we have here. But sadly, it's one of the most degraded areas of ocean because of how intensely humans are using it for fishing and shipping and oil extraction. Many of the animals I've mentioned so far and, and the habitats are threatened directly by overfishing and trawling, um, but also indirectly because of things like bycatch. Um, it's a really common sight nowadays to see cetaceans dead and stranded. And when we take them to the lab, we see obscenely high levels of pollutants in their blubber. And of course, as climate change gets worse, we are going to see species distributions and ranges shift due to the changes in temperature. So what can we actually do to help? Well, first things first, we need to support actually enforced marine protected areas to give wildlife and habitats time and space to recover from overfishing. Also, campaigning for stricter penalties for water companies who keep releasing untreated sewage directly into the North Sea. And lastly, uh, taking steps to reduce our dependence on uh, fossil fuels, so supporting renewable energy. And if you'd like to do something a bit more hands-on, like I do, you can become a certified marine mammal medic, and that means you go out and help seals and cetaceans who are in need. I hope this hasn't been too depressing, but this is what I find quite often with marine biology. As soon as I learn about a cool new animal, I have to deal with the fact that it is under threat. I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you ever do visit South End, keep an eye out for harbour porpoises and their massive testicles. See you again soon and best wishes.